school's out for 2022, and so is Daniel Ricciardo from Formula One. That means that it, that it is time for us to give you our driver grades for the 2022 season. And if that intro is anything to go by, you'll know how this is going to go. Welcome to episode 251 of Grid Talk. Today we are here to chat about, as mentioned, our driver ratings for the 2022 season. My name is Tom Downey, and joining me today we have Jared from Hit the Apex podcast. Hi, guys. We also have Philip Matthew from the Grip Flip podcast. Hello. And I'm very pleased to say, making a very, very welcome return to the Formula One Grid Talk podcast, we have the co founder of Football Chronicle and one of my co hosts, Mr. George Housen. Oh, thank you so much for the intro, Tom. It's good to be back. Very good to it, be back. It's been a it, while. <laughs> it has. I am very, very pleased to see you back, sir. Just before we begin, if we enjoy, uh, sorry, if you enjoy this podcast, and also if we enjoy it, I suppose, we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five star rating on Spotify or a five star review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, you'll automatically go into our monthly draw to win a Grid Talk t shirt from our champion range of merch. Also, if you're one of the 70 odd percent of people who are not yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So now that all the formalities are out of the way, as mentioned a few times, we are going to be looking at our driver ratings for the 2022 season. Now, there'll be a couple of a couple of grades on here which are certainly going to divide opinion and some which I think should be a foregone conclusion. So we'll start at the top of the grades because this is an almost unanimous decision. I'm still going to threaten to kneecap Tom Horrocks if, if, um, because he didn't give him an A, an, a, an a star or an A+. Plus. But Jared, Max Verstappen, he got an A+, plus from the vast majority of us. Do you agree, disagree, or do you plead the fifth? <laughs> um, I think I'd get my head chopped off if I disagreed. Uh, no, but yes, A+, plus, one of the only drivers deserving of that rating this season. It's hard not to wax lyrical about him, his efforts this year. And I actually spent the week going back and watching highlights from each of the races, <laughs> uh, watching highlights from each of, the, each of the races this year. And when you look at the early part of the year, I think it was probably the toughest for Red Bull and Verstappen quite while well, they didn't have the car where they wanted to. We heard that the car was a bit overweight and, you know, didn't have the ultimate pace compared to Ferrari. So some of those races such as Barcelona and Miami in particular, having to, you know, come back and win the race quite late on in the piece, you know, just shows the effort of a world champion. He's been quite unflappable as well. Um, and then you look at drives such as Hungary and Belgium coming from down the grid to win, you know, Belgium, well, I think it was P14 it was, he came back to win the race. So, you know, there's no faulting um, Max on track this year, thoroughly deserving of the two-time world champion status as well. And, you know, going into next year, it's on everyone else to try and step their game up to beat him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I obviously gave him a a a plus, a star. I echo a lot of what you said. You know, he had one of the best seasons I think we've ever seen in F1 for a while. Philip, one of your, or Phil, sorry, um, one of your Mercedes boys, it was Mr. Crikey himself, George Russell. He got an A, obviously got um, obviously got pole position in Hungary midway through the season, but obviously had to sprint and, and Grand Prix win, and deservedly so, in um, in Brazil. How do you rate his season this year? Uh, I would go and say that considering where he's been for the last three years at the back end of the grid, to have to be to get thrown into the deep end, and so to speak, and drive with a seven-time world champion, add the fact that the car was basically trash for most of the season, and he responded and drove. He was able to manage the car for a good part of the season better than his more experienced and accomplished teammate. And then the way he raced at Brazil was outstanding in the um, – I mean, he heck, even when he goes and goes off the track – to, uh, during qualifying, that also kind of helped him too. So he had quite he had the weekend of his life at Brazil. 
and gets his first career Grand Prix victory, beating Lewis Hamilton. And he's he's only what the second driver I think that's legitimately beaten Lewis Hamilton that has been a teammate. So I mean, there's credit to him. I think there's a lot of potential for George Russell long term uh, with Mercedes. They know that he's the guy. And considering how bad the car was, he was able to make it work because he's used to driving bad cars. And uh, with the updates, the W14, what they're going to do, who knows what it what that may mean um, in regards to maybe answering Max, maybe giving him a little bit of competition, somebody that he would have to deal with on a race-by-race basis. But to me, Tom, I think that, Great is very fair and relative to his teammate. He did beat him uh, by a bunch of points. He won. He got poles, and you know he, he got him by a few points there, grade wise. So uh, I think it is a good grade considering it's his first year in a really good car. Yeah, I think that is uh, that is fair to say about George this year. Speaking of George, George, our George, the next driver to, to get to get an A this year was Lando Norris. Of course, the only driver outside of the top six to stand on the podium, um, and especially relative to both his teammate, who we'll get into in a bit, well, quite a bit, and, and also the car's performance. Yeah, again, he got given an A. Do you agree with that for Lando's season? Yeah, I went with an A for, for Lando as well. I mean, it's been another great season for him. The kid is insanely talented. He's He's only just turned 23 years old, so he's still very young. And next year, he's going to be leading the team in terms of experience for the first time in his career. But I absolutely think he's up to the task for next year, 100%. Um, Oscar Piastri is going to do very well to keep up with him. Because this year, he is, he's just been on another level. Like you said, Tom, he's he was the only guy from outside of Ferrari, Red Bull and um, Mercedes to get a podium. That was in Imola. And if you just look at the standings, he is best of the rest, but he is best of the rest by a long way. He's 30 points ahead of Ocon, who was also ahead of Alonso. And obviously, if you compare from comparing to him to his, to his teammate, it's there is no comparison. It's absolutely chalk and cheese. Norris, again, stepping it up this year. In, in my mind, I, I think he's a future world champion if he gets the right car. Absolutely. But yeah, no, he's, he's had an incredible season. Very consistent. Only um, one, two, three, four. Only five races he didn't score points in. Only And only three of them were actual ones where he finished it as well. So a very, very consistent season for him, despite not really having the best car at times. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, that um, that McLaren definitely took a step back from, from, from the car they had in 2021, where he obviously took his first pole. So yeah. Uh, he he had uh, he had quite the season um, this year, and I'm looking forward to seeing him on the grid for for many a year to come. But um, so as we step out of the of the A and and A plus category, and we have our first B ranked driver, which is uh, Charles Leclerc. Um, now, obviously, Leclerc had. He had an interesting season. I think it's fair to say, you, you know, I, you know, and for me, I think the battle of the season was Leclerc versus Ferrari when it comes to strategy, which probably explains why he got to be in the first place. Obviously, a shed load of pole positions. I think he had ten this season, nine or ten. But yeah, ultimately, the season didn't quite work out for him. How do, how uh, how do you feel the season went? I definitely agree with the rating. He's been given a bit of a. B grade driver without sounding horrible. For me, the difference this year, and you know, it's it's kind of galling when you look back to the opening races in Bahrain and then Australia as well, where he took those um, sensational wins. And it was being said that you know, look at the maturity on him. He's look, he looks like he's ready for a world championship challenge but then how quickly does that unravel as well and I think it's the decline through the season after that that you know I think has really brought Leclerc down as well as Ferrari yes you know there's been a lot of problems on the team side with the pit wall operationally and then reliability as well but then for what it's worth you know from the driver's view as well you look at what happened in France and it's shades of Sebastian Vettel in 2018 in Germany, losing it as well. And that's kind of where it all fell apart for him this season with his championship bid, you know, he could have kept it alive potentially. So um, 
yeah, for that, you know, it just doesn't look like Leclerc as well is, you know, mature enough or mentally ready to take that extra step to be what it takes to be world champion. And when you're going up against someone like a Max Verstappen who was in a league of his own this year, and who knows, next year we might even have Mercedes back in the mix and, you know, we know how Lewis Hamilton is. We'll see how George Russell is. Yeah, Leclerc wasn't quite up to that standard, which is really sad because the accolades that he's picked up this year, the pole positions, like you said, he was the the pole winner overall. And then he's had three wins as well to his name, which is, you know, three more wins than he's had in the last couple of years driving for Ferrari. But I think the expectation on Ferrari and him this year was that they could be closer in the world championship. Sure, if they didn't win it, it would have been a different you know, kettle of fish had they had gone to at least, you know, the last couple of races in terms of the points difference, not let it balloon out after the mid-season break. So, you know, I think there's going to be a bit of soul searching in Maranello over the off season. And I think Leclerc as well is going to have to come back a bit stronger and, um, you know, just a bit more tougher, I think, with the way uh, he conducts himself in the car. Yeah, you you made a very good, very good point about him perhaps not quite being... At, at the right level mentally for um, a, a championship fight, and and I and I do still think he's got he's he's got a bit of a way to go. Myself, I think a good emphasis of this was uh, was was his now infamous scream in uh, in Le Castle after 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 he binned it into the wall. But yeah, hopefully we see better of him next year, and hopefully Ferrari can get you know to get their act together a bit. But it's Ferrari, who knows? They'll probably box in for Inters at some point when it's bone dry. Phil, Sergio Perez also got given a B. Bit of a season of contrasting fortunes, you could say. Started the season pretty strongly. You know, you know, you know um had had pole and you know had had a win stripped away from him in uh in Saudi. Do you agree with the B? Do you think it's harsh? Do you think it's fair? Do you think it's generous? I think it's fair, uh, Tom. Uh, in the end, his main job is to be the domestique for Max Verstappen. In that sense, he succeeded. For Sergio Perez, he, he has to help with, with going and getting points for the constructors. They won the constructors going away. Of course, they had the best car. So the two main things he was there for, he accomplished. Now, Sergio Perez himself, Winning Monaco, huge, big cha- champion, like going and winning outside of winning a championship in Formula and winning the Monaco Grand Prix has the gravitas and all that that goes with what Formula One's all about. However, I would think that he, is, he would be disappointed in his season, thinking that he might have had more opportunities if given the opportunity to maybe win a few more races, but finish second in the world championship. They win the Constructors' Championship. I mean, honestly, I think they should have thrown him a bone and and let him win at Mexico because the championship was already over. And um, But that's just me. But yeah, I think for what they ask him to do, he did what he was supposed to do. And uh, I think some of the things Red Bull was trying to, with some of the aero changes, may have taken his confidence away in the early summertime, which kind of set him on the back foot. He had to recover, but by the end of the year, he did um, and uh, gave Charles Leclerc a run there. Um, I think he finished. I might. I mean, I guess Charles Leclerc probably finished second. I'm, I'm forgetting off the top of my head now. Yeah, I, I agree with you about about the about the Mexico thing. You know, you know, the championship was done and dusted, and maybe it would help Perez in in his in his quest for um his quest for second in the championship, but. But you know, it's not not you know, it's just it's not all one over one race weekend. Yeah, that's his average twenty twenty one. George Carlos Sainz also got a B driving for, driving for Ferrari. Well, actually, my opinion doesn't matter because he's got a bit to talk about. Do you agree with that? Do you disagree? He had a bit of an interesting season, to say the least. He had a very interesting season. Yeah, absolutely. He's a, he's a very difficult one to grade to me. Uh, grade for me. I mean, I'm going to get Fernando Alonso a bit in. A, as well, and he's another one that I found very difficult to grade. Uh, but talking about signs, I mean, you know, for a few seasons before this, maybe three seasons in a row, for me, I think, I think he was the most consistent driver on the grid. He was very impressive. You know, he was just he was just getting the results in for McLaren and then for Ferrari. 
this year, maybe because of the car a little bit, he's made some mistakes, especially early on in the season. But he's also got his first win, which is huge for him. Um, and at that point, I was genuinely thinking, right, this this could be the start of a championship challenge for him, potentially. You know, it was still pretty early in the season at that point. So, but unfortunately for him, it never happened. He wasn't that close to Charles Leclerc in the end, 60 odd points in the end um, between those two as teammates. And for me, I can't go any higher than a B. I, but I also think a C would be very harsh. I don't think he's been average. I think he's had points when he's done quite well. Um, Canada, he almost got the win, chasing down Max Verstappen in the closing stages for that, obviously Silverstone as well. So, it, not the best season for Sainz by any means, worse than what he has been in previous years. But if Ferrari get a car for him that's a bit more consistent next year, he could be more consistent as well. Yeah, it was just it was just a bit unfortunate to um, that he sort of began began to come of age as Ferrari imploded, and he was also possibly robbed of a second win in Austin as well because he kept his nose clean going into the first corner and then George Russell steamed into him. Uh, and for, yeah, that was unfortunate. But yeah, it was a, yeah, it, just a, it, it was a mixed bag for him. Still, it was, we give a lot of drivers Bs this year, uh, just looking at it. So um, so the next one, Jared, we have Lewis Hamilton who had a B. Now, obviously, you know, Hamilton, you, you know, one of the most successful drivers in, in F1, you know, on stats wise, people may say it was his worst season ever because he didn't have a pole position and he didn't have a win for the first time in his F1 career, which is mad to think about. Um, if, you know, when you realize how long he's been on the grid, but a B, bearing in mind he was apparently doing a lot of uh, sort of development work at the start of the season where he was running alternate wings and alternate setups, which explains his, his lack of pace. Do you, do you agree with that for, for him this season? How uh, how do you think his season fared overall? Uh, look, I reckon it, it is fair, to be honest, um, and it is difficult, I think, for a lot of people to give him that sort of rating after being where he has been the last eight years in particular. But, yeah, you know, respected to his teammate this year, when you look purely on the numbers, Russell was able to get a lot more out of uh, the difficult car that was the W13. Uh, Hamilton, of course, you know, we can praise him for all the development work that he's done and, you know, the consistency he did have in the middle part of the season to get on the podium. I think it was five times in a row, um, if I'm not mistaken, but then just, you know, finishing in behind, you know, the top two teams, uh, Red Bull and Ferrari, and then, yeah, getting points off, Ferrari in particular towards the end of the season. So I guess, you know, not being at the sharp end perhaps or not getting to groups with this car has probably hurt him a little bit in terms of the rating. I fully think that, you know, once they get a stronger car concept and have a more consistent package, they'll rebound, even if it is like a 2019 or 2018 Diva that they have. This was definitely much more worse than that. So, you know, I think when that happens, we'll see Hamilton because he is a, you know, confidence-based driver. We'll see his confidence get back up as well. And, you know, he might yet beat Russell next year. So we'll just wait and see. But, yeah, I think for for this season, what it was, you know, it's the season that Mercedes themselves want to can in the history book and never have to look at again. Um you know, B for Lewis Hamilton seems fair. It would be it'd be kind of stretching it if you tried to give him a bit more than that. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, on the flip side, I also think giving him a C would be pretty harsh you know, because he, he did he did get a boatload of podiums this year mm. um, and, and a couple of second places. So George, I'll give you Esteban Ocon. He he had a B as well. You know, arguably worse season than last year. You know, had a couple of clashes with his teammate, notably in, in Brazil. But all in all, aside from that Alpine reliability coming in, oh so clutch once again. He had an all right season, I think. How do you, how do you think he went? I agree with the B grade for him. I went for a B grade of him. And looking at uh, the table here, everybody but two people gave him a B. So it, I think we're pretty, we're pretty, you know, cons- we've got a consensus on that as as much as we can between uh, 15 panelists pal- or whatever. Uh, putting the votes in so yeah no I, I went for a B for him I think that's fair aside from Norris he was best of the rest I don't the thing is with Ocon he, he's one of those drivers that he does alright most of the time and because of that 
that's enough. That's all he needs to do a lot of the time. Alonso is a lot more exciting to watch. He's a lot more up and down. But Ocon just was bringing the results in pretty much almost every race. And that can't be understated because of that. That helps Alpine to get fourth in the Constructors' Championship, which is which is massive for them. So the only thing with Ocon is that you you would hope that he would have another amazing weekend like he did last year in Hungary. You know, he got his first win. That didn't happen. That wasn't in the car probably anyway, to be fair. But still, uh, you may hope next year that he'll kick on a bit more and, and um, you know, do potentially a little bit better. But it's still a, a good season for him. Um, be very interesting to see how he gets on next year with Gasly, which we've talked about at length. Um, <laughs> that'll be a uh, that'll be a spicy partnership, I think. That oh, absolutely, yeah, because the, the two of certainly, certainly used to hate each other, but I can't wait to see them have a force fun for for the next two or three years until until one of them gets fed up and, and leaves. Right, Phil. Yes, I did absolutely change the order on purpose for for, for this. Um, your boy Fernando Alonso. Uh, he he got a B this year. And everybody knows that he lost out on 300 points and would have obviously been world champion, like he said. He was robbed of, I think, of his 17th world world championship title this year. I'll tell you what, the floor is yours. Off you go. I mean, we mentioned it just now, George and you, Tom, with uh, the great reliability of Alpine. So in the case of um, Fred, he definitely did not uh, benefit from that. However, his uh, famous Napoleon complex came through when before he goes and napalms himself out of another team. Well, he's he's tried to napalm himself out of this team, I think, 78 times, and he's went back every time. So now he's just going over to be get daddy's money from Lance Stroll or Lauren Stroll and uh, drive around in the midfield just like he's been doing for all these years. And he'll still be angry and he'll still whine and moan about Lewis and be butthurt about 2007 and then do all kinds of other stupid crap. I mean, fine. I, I credit to him. He did have like at Montreal, he had that great start and he had great runs going a lot of the time. The point he's a very talented race car driver. He's a two time world champion, 32 Grand Prix win, all that. He has driven all these different cars at the end of the day. He's toxic and there's a reason why he's jumped around all these different teams. There's a reason why a whole entire manufacturer does not want to have anything to do with him to the point where he cannot go and run the Indianapolis 500 ever again, really, truly, in a, in a competitive way. So, I mean, there's, I mean, he's going to be what he is. He's going to be a legend in, in Spain no matter what. You know, Carlos Sainz Jr. looks up to him greatly. A lot, a lot of people look up to him. He does a lot of things with kids, and that, that's all fine and well. But at the end of the day, he he kind of is setting a tone like the way he is kind of reminds me of somebody else that is up the top of the grid. And I don't think that's a positive, especially now that he's going to be out in the middle of nowhere driving the Aston Martin, which isn't going to do anything of great significance. I mean, unless they copy Red Bull, uh, Red Bull's car this next year, like they used to copy Mercedes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Alonso is just Mr. Toxic, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he has his ashes scattered at Team Enstone. He loves that place so much. So give it, give it two seasons, and one season, once he's fallen out with Lawrence Stroll, which won't take long, but he'll be back to replace probably Ocon. Um, I wouldn't put it past him. Anyway, <laughs> right, moving on. We're now into the C grade. Jared Valtteri Bottas. He had a C for the season. He had a good start to the season with the with Alfa Romeo looking competitive, but unfortunately, as development slowed and and Ferrari reliability sort of curtailed, he, um, it it some, sort of somewhat fell off a bit. Do you think his C is fair for for how he fared this season? Yeah, pretty much. Like a pass is what I'd give Bottas. So. Yes, you know his career you could say not really his career but you know he looked revitalized moving away from Mercedes and moving into a much more relaxed environment at Alfa Romeo where he kind of became the spearhead if you want to say you know he's the alpha driver now and they'll rely on him for a lot of the development work and it's going to be important in particular moving into 2026 as well with Audi incoming. It'll be interesting to see what Bottas's role will be there in all that, if he does have a role. 
but yeah, you know, some excellent drives from him, you know, uh, Imola being the highlight, of course, fifth. Um, and that was the result in the end that got Alfa Romeo ahead of Aston Martin in the Constructors' Championship on countback. So, but yeah, you know, like you say, kind of towards the middle and the end of the season, it all kind of went downhill for them. The car development, the reliability as well. And then, again, Bottas is just one of those drivers, as we've learned over the last few years, that he just, he's a great driver, but there's not that, spark or that extra little bit that you get you know that makes someone like a Verstappen or a Hamilton or a Russell or Norris special you know and if if we got that from him in the alpha this year perhaps he would have been closer to a B or a B plus but you know for what he puts in you know which you know it's kind of an understatement what Bodas put it puts in because you know I'm sure he works really hard and everything he's won for his fitness and all that but for what it is, I think, you know, it's an improvement on what Alpha had last year, for example, with um, his retired compatriot and also Italian Jesus as well. So definitely a great driver to have in there. And I'm hoping, yeah, next year he could step it up to potentially being B grade. <laughs> Sounds wrong every time I say it, but yeah. You made a very good point about him, about him not being um so sort of like not not being at the sort of like the top echelons of the sport and yeah. just being a sort of like solid solid mid mid tier driver. Seems harsh to say given you know he's had some pole positions and wins, but you know, he just he just doesn't have that same sort of bite, that same sort of spark as uh, as some of the others. But um right, we'll go back to proper order now. Phil, next we have uh, Kevin Magnussen, C grade, a very, very up and down season for him. Um, a bit like Perez, he, he had very much contrasting fortunes. Obviously, had that incredible pole position where, never mind Pierre Gatti likes that. It was everybody likes that. But also, also, you know, had had some had some not not as good moments. You know, where, where he had some you know, early exits in Q one and you know a couple of you know, dodgy flag calls from the stewards, mainly by Ocon crying over the radio and that. Do you think a C is fair for him? Do, do, do you think he arguably deserves more this season? I think it's right, Tom. Uh, when it comes to Kevin Magnuson to get called, like, I don't know how many weeks before the season to come back to Formula One, when he was looking at probably going and staying with Ganassi here in the U.S. to run sports cars, jump back in, take over as a team leader with a car that at least initially they had some good things going but then when the reality set in typical Haas they were going to fall behind and it kind of went back that way but Kevin Magnuson at least his addition or like reintroduction into the team changed the whole entire vibe into a very positive vibe you didn't have to look at the team as that horrendous you know eyesore in the back with that with the with Igor and whoever driving and then instead you have Kevin Magnuson who's you know a professional and has done this for many years for different teams and enjoys the sport I know he wants to win of course he does and um, he showed that kind of talent here in the states but I think he also thrives in knowing that he's the leader of the team and especially with uh, the current move that uh, bring uh, Hulkenberg into the fold. He's going to still be the leader. Uh, we'll see what Haas can do. They have a new sponsor. Will that help them in their development? Will they be able to be more competitive? They held on basically for the majority of the year. But for him, that poll at Brazil was one of the great moments in, in the year, whole year. His smile went from year to year. I'm sure his dad was emotional everybody's mom and dad were both emotional because it's like they never thought that kevin would get a pole in formula one um but i mean credit to him for what he did to make haas at least viable again and um you know who knows what it may bring but i think ferrari of course we we talked about you guys talked about uh leclerc and signs i think a big piece of what will happen with haas is what happens with that power unit. And um, if they're falling out of races, then it really doesn't matter what Kevin Magnuson does. So we'll see what happens with the power unit. 
Yeah, promised a lot this season, and obviously, obviously, I hadn't had a good return to the sport. But um, I think Hass has still got a long way to come next year. But hopefully, with his new teammate, you know, they're, they're sure to have a have a bit of a history. Hopefully, that doesn't get in the way. But um, George, the man who sort of captured everybody's hearts over, over the last couple of seasons, gone from being a bit of a public enemy to someone who everybody now sort of gazes at. Um, adoringly Sebastian Vettel got to see had a bit of a resurgence towards the end of the season um you know had some good battles and got some some good last laps in in Japan in the wet and in in Austin with K Mag and, and a few others looked pretty decent in racing but but that that car struggled a bit in quality trim do you, do you think you see is fair for him this year you know given given the car's performance why why is Seb retiring why is he retiring you know honestly he uh, for me I went for B for him personally I think he had a really good season I think um I think if there was one more B grade instead of a C grade because I did the averages for these he would have got a B overall so he was this close to getting a B from us overall but yeah I mean Obviously, it's not been the perfect season for him, but in terms of consistency, I think I think he's been brilliant. Um, the car uh, all season has been awful in qualifying. It's been shocking. Uh, and to try and make up for that, Vettel and Stroll both ran some really wacky alternate strategies, which ended up either with them in a 17th or 7th, you know, it could have gone either way with them. So... I think he's. I think he's done a really good job. Obviously, yeah. I mean, I, I was one of the people when he was winning his championships, thinking I really don't like this guy. He's he's ruining the sport. That you know, that that classic um, uh, Lewis Hamilton article where it says Sebastian Vettel dominance is threatening the sport, which obviously is very ironic with, <laughs> with what happened literally a year later. But yeah, I mean, I I think he's been great. Seb, I'm going to miss him no end. I really, really hope he comes back. There's all those rumours about him making a comeback when Sauber become Audi in 2025 or whenever it is. You know, I really hope that happens. But at the same time, he's a family man. He's got his environmental stuff. He's kind of a mentor to Mick Schumacher. Obviously, Mick Schumacher is going to be the third driver at Mercedes next year. So I'm sure he'll be involved with that as well. So you know what? You know, Seb, if he comes back, great. If he doesn't, fair enough. You know, enjoy your retirement because you've absolutely earned it. And I think it's a crying shame that he's leaving Aston Martin and Lance Stroll sticking around, it, it, it just doesn't seem right. But obviously, one's a four-time world champion and the other one's a, the son of the owner of the team. I would and wouldn't like to see um, Vettel back on back on the grid, if that makes sense. You know, he's, he's been there for an awfully long time, so it's, uh, we'll hopefully just, uh, just, just head off and, and enjoy retirement. And I don't know if any any uh, any of you saw, but there was a really nice photo of him that that someone took where he was sit, sitting on a park bench in the, in the middle of. Is it Lausanne? He lives in Switzerland. I'm not sure, but he just looked so happy and relaxed. It was just like, yeah, just warmed the cockles, as as we say here in the UK. All right, Jared Bottas' teammate uh, Joe Guan Yu. He also got to see a pretty impressive debut season. I would certainly say. Do you think he's a deserving of a C and? And an extension of that, do you think he's earned his place to stay in F1? Look, like, you know, to talk about that, I'm going to have to wind the clock back 12 months and admit that I was one of those people who certainly didn't think that he was um, deserving of getting the one remaining seat that was left in the silly season uh, coming into this year. Thought, you know, you know, parochially F2 champion from 2021, Oscar Piastri should have got that seat. Uh, but, you know, that's all worked itself out anyway. But for what it is, uh, I think young Joe has definitely justified his place on the grid this year and also for next year. Much like his teammate, you know, he's done enough for a pass. And I think for a rookie, that's actually quite an impressive thing. You know, when you look at his season, he's caused no trouble whatsoever on his own. Most of his misfortunes and, you know, retirements have come through car reliability or, you know, incidents involving other drivers. So, and of course, you know, surviving that horror shunt at Silverstone at turn one as well, that was probably one of those moments where looking back on it, it's like, well, you know, how did we, um, how did we all, uh, how did we all get through that in one piece and unscathed? So, you know, it was quite, quite a moment for sure. As far as his results are concerned, yeah, you know, kind of limited by the car at times, 
as well through the middle of the season. But, you know, to pick up eighth in Canada, I think it was, and a couple of 10th places as well, quite solid. What he's going to have to do next season, of course, is, you know, show a step, you know, show an improvement. And I kind of liken him in a way to to Nicholas Latifi. And I hope, you know, the his career, uh, Joe's career does not end same way as Latifi's does in that kind of spotlight and becomes a meme as such because, you know, he's, he's, he seems like a pretty nice guy. But, um, you know, he's done enough to tick all the boxes for his first season, see how he goes next year. And then, you know, I don't think, you know, in terms of the future of that team, he's going to be around for long, but for the time that he is, let's hope that he can actually just continue putting in some decent performances. And, you know, if he drops below a C next year, then, you know, definitely we could have that conversation again and say, look, you know, he's not quite right. But um, yeah, coming in new regulations this year, being the only rookie as well on the grid, he's not done half a bad job. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's, he's definitely fallen victim A to some, uh, to some reliable, uh, reliability issues as all the Ferrari cloud drivers have this season. There have been a few times where he's 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 either had to DNF or he's um you know he's always had mechanical retirements on on track. Mainly mainly due to power unit issue related issues. That's a really bad way of phrasing that. But anyway, Phil, our last C graded driver is the Williams driver and and obviously not the TV because he was awful, of Alex Albon. Uh, he got a C, obviously scored points, I think, on two or three occasions in that car. Not a bad return for, for, for the young uh, British tie driver. Would you agree or disagree? Yeah, I mean, he, they're in the worst car on the grid. Uh, you'd think that with the new regulations, Williams and Doralton would have, whoever would have been able to make a better concept but they went kind of down the same road as will um both aston and mercedes kind of makes sense all of them using the same power unit and that was a mistake however in the case of uh, alex albon taking a year off driving dtm and then jumping back into formula one uh, with the new new team different power unit, all that stuff and he roundly beats his teammate and basically takes over that leadership role, which he's never had. So, I mean, credit to him. He also got, he almost, I mean, he had that the huge health scare and, you know, he might have not made it out of that surgery. So all, to go from that to getting back in a race car is its own uh, epic deal. But hopefully for him and hopefully for Williams, I mean, they're going through some changes right now. Don't have a team principal or a, a lead lead uh, director of uh, performance or whatever so that's not really good with two months to go before they actually start testing so or thereabouts so for what they had and what they brought to the table i i think alex albon did a really good job and people question some of his tactics the way he drives you know his ability to close back when he drove in the red bull and uh, for Alpha Tori or whatever they were when he drove for them. But now I think he's matured a bit and um, he belongs. And now he's going to be uh, a lead dog with a new teammate uh, next year. So that'll be an interesting uh, dynamic with those two guys. Yeah, it's going to be good to see Albin in that sort of team leader role next season. I think I I, I do agree with you, and 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 I certainly think he looked a bit sort of almost revitalised uh, coming you know sort of coming back into F one because it's very easy if you know if a driver has time off to come back in and they're not quite as good as they used to be, especially if they left on slightly acrimonious terms like he did when he lost his Red Bull drive. So yeah, so full credit to Albin for coming back, keeping his head up. He is a decent driver, to be fair. Speaking of outside Red Bull drivers, George Pierre Gasly got rated as as a D this season. Yeah, he's uh, it was a bit of a fall from grace from his twenty twenty one season, where he was, you know, one of the best sort of midfield drivers that we saw. Do you think it was a bit of a case of him getting 
a bit sort of disillusioned with, with the whole Red Bull setup. I think especially after it was announced that Perez had signed a multi-year deal, you know, he, he sort of seemed to he seemed to so, sort of go a bit wayward after that. Do you think a D is fair? And do you think that Alpine is going to give him a sort of a, a new lease of life almost? Uh, yes and yes. I think a D is a very fair rating for him. Um, again, we've, we were very consistent on that in the ratings, I think. Everybody gave him that rating except for one person who gave him an E. I can't see that is on the screen, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, the, the things with Gasly is that we know how talented he is. The guy won a race in an Alpha Tauri. Uh, the guy got a podium last year in an Alpha Tauri. Uh, that car has no right being as far up the grid as it has been. And even though this season has been a fall from grace for him, absolutely, he's still comfortably beating Yuki Sonoda. Um, you can you can say what you want about Sonoda, but he's still beat his teammates. So there is that. I think the problem with Gasly was that after, I mean, I'm not sure when this got announced, but I'm, I think I think it was probably last year. I think Helmut Marko basically said that, um, basically said, you know, he's got no chance. He's not going to be in Red Bull again. We've tried him. He was crap. It didn't work out. We got rid of him. Which, as a driver, hearing that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure on some level they kind of knew that, but to hear it and for them to say that publicly about him, that must have been crushing for him. So I think this entire season, since the very start, he's just been trying to look for a way out. And he's got that now in Alpine. Uh, the, pro- the problem is, is that I'm sure he was hoping to be partnering Alonso on Pep, but that's not going to happen. Uh, he's going to be partnering Ocon. So we'll see how those two get on, obviously. Uh, this year was, yeah, this year was not a good year. But I will I will say this about him, though. I'm just looking through his results. He's only had, I think, three retirements through the whole year, and one of them was for a crash. That was it. Problem was, it was crashing into his teammate, a <laughs> Silverstone. So the, he broke the golden rule of motorsport. Don't crash into your teammate. Um, so yeah, I'm sure Kasley will do better next year and I'm sure he'll be hoping for better next year but th- this year was a bit of a write-off for him and Alpha Tauri as well, really. I pretty much agree with everything you just said, George. You know, he's, uh, Kasley needs that that sort of that sort of fresh start in F1 because uh, otherwise he'd have, he'd have turned very much into one of the sort of also-rans of F1. So next, next on the list, uh, Jared, we have Yuki... Uh, no, we don't. We have Mick Schumacher, who also got a D this season. Yeah, I mean, Schumacher, he had some bad luck this season, but ultimately, I think it's hard, it's hard to look past that because you know, he just ultimately didn't, didn't quite have the pace. How do you think his season fared overall? I think it is pretty spot on, rating him a D for this season. Yeah, look... You know, you look at the crashes that he's had at the start of the year, you know, Saudi, where he rode off the car and qualifying and they couldn't even get the car or like they could have got the car back together for the race. But apparently they didn't want to spend the extra money because, as we know, Haas is still uh, very much a cash strapped team. So I think that doesn't work in his favor either. The fact that the team's financial situation isn't the most flush. And then we go to Monaco and has another massive crash and writes off the car. So, you know, given that, you know, last year we're all having fun, poking fun at his former teammate for being the crash uh, Meister, it's kind of sad that you know Mick in his second season in F1 has kind of taken on that reputation. And yes, you know while it all looks like doom and gloom and everything, there was some peaks as well, which was great. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough of those peaks for him to perhaps hang on to his seat as um, nice as it would have been. I think you know personally, I'm sure I think Tom, you would agree with this as well that bringing someone like a Hulkenberg back who is a known entity and he's known for not really being much more than just a midfield specialist. It would have been nicer to see uh, Mick get a third season because at worst, what are you going to get similar to what you got this season? So, you know, and at best he could have made that step like he did in his second years in the junior formulas. Sadly, you know, in F1, he didn't make that step in the second year, but in the third year, it could have all come together. But, you know, just what it was, inconsistent, slower than his teammate in qualifying as well. And I think, you know, having Magnussen come back this year was going to be Schumacher's litmus test because, you know, he had a benchmark in Kevin that he could use. And, you know, more often than not, he was below that benchmark. So that kind of just, you know, showed him up straight away. But still going to highlight points in Silverstone and then Austria how can you not forget the sprint race where he was um, going toe-to-toe with Lewis Hamilton 
in a Mercedes while driving Haas. He did miss out on being in the top eight on that occasion, but he still did come home and finish sixth in the race too. So, you know, I hope he isn't completely lost to F1. I don't think he's going to do special things. He might be one of those, you know, Bottas level drivers, but I certainly hope, you know, he isn't lost altogether. Hopefully he does get a, a role in, you know, sports cars potentially if if that's his thing you know i was thinking if he didn't cut or with ferrari and cut ties with him he'd be a solid driver to put in the um lmp program that they've uh, stitched together for next year but um that won't be the case as we know and he'll be third and reserve driver for mercedes and you know interesting to know as well that you know mercedes reserve drivers over the last few years have been called upon more to deputise than any other driver. So who knows? We might see him um, make a cameo next year as well. We may well see him in, in, in a few um, FP1 sessions or, uh, you, you know, if, you know, heaven forbid the worst happened and you know, when, when the Merc drivers you know, caught, you know, tested positive for COVID or, you know, had a horrible accident or something. Not that any of us want, want to see that happen. Um, but, but, you know, you know we, we saw it this season where Seb obviously tested positive at the start of the season. So... You never know, you know, and he was definitely unlucky with with some elements of uh, of reliability, and uh, you know, you know, can't forget he qualified P six in Canada. You know, Hass or, or P six or P eight Hass locked out either the third or fourth row. Or so. I think it was the third row that they locked out. Yeah, I th- thank you, George. I, I, I thought it was. He did have some good ups this season, but unfortunately, you know, you know his 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 crashes, which he had a few last season, uh, uh, twenty twenty one, I should say. But yeah, they got overshadowed by by his teammate or his then teammate being who he was, um, who should go unnamed. Well, the last of the degraded drivers, we have Yuki Tsunoda. I mean, I didn't really see an awful lot of him this season. He made some stupid mistakes. Um, he shouted and swore over the radio, which is something I do when I'm on the phone. And then, and then just all, then just all, all, all in all was um, almost sort of largely anonymous. Give us your thoughts on Yuki this season, if any. Uh, yeah, there's really. I mean, the Alpha Tori team took a big step back with this rules change. Uh, they expedited uh, Pierre Gasly's move finally out of the Red Bull program. In Yuki's case, he has one year against um, an older uh, but experienced in other formulas uh, teammate um, now coming in with the specter of the likes of Iwasa uh, in Formula 2, who has the Honda ties as well, and other Red Bull people, since they have like 17,000 drivers, that could possibly go and take over that seat so can he show up here in his third season or is it going to be more of the same is he going to continue to be takuma sato 2.0 the negative side or is he going to take the steps that takuma sato even at the end of his career formula one career able to get a podium here and there qualify uh pretty good or i mean i think at the the way we're looking at it this time next year we're going to be talking about him going to IndyCar uh, personally or going to Super Formula. And I and so uh, the grade is earned. He didn't really show a lot of potential, a lot of growth. Uh, the car was trash, but the fact is you have to, you take for what it's worth. They couldn't make a double change there, but I do believe if Owasa has a good year uh, next or in 23, that he would probably be primed for that seat. Uh, at Alpha Tori. Yeah, I, I think next season is make a break for him, especially with people like Yuasa coming through and uh, and uh, and um, yeah, you, you know, you sort of some some other sort of Red Bull back drivers. You know, you've got to look at Liam Lawson potentially coming through as well. You know, it could have been Yuri Vips, I wouldn't say, if he wouldn't have been an idiot, but there we go. Right, George, we're down into the E grades now. The two drivers here. The first one, this is where I can just sense all of Australia beginning to turn violently towards us. Daniel Ricardo got rated an E this season. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Jo- yeah, I'm sorry, Joe. This is not going to be very good to, l- to listen to from Shaw. Um, 
<laughs> it's honestly, yeah. You know what though? I will say that I was one of the more generous drivers, uh, one of the more generous graders for Ricardo. I did give him a D for this, but I think an E is a fair grade as well because he is. It's been awful. It's been absolutely awful. I, I yeah, Drod actually gave him an F. So Australia, find where he lives. You, you have to come after him. <laughs> um, yeah. So honestly, yeah, it's been it's been terrible. I mean, you look at the gap between teammates this year and um, the gap between Norris and Ricardo has been ridiculous and you know the, the, there were times there were times when Ricardo did all right in Singapore he did all right Australia he did all right but unfortunately these are just interspersed with not scoring points or scoring low points when Norris was in high points positions almost every race it's shocking really you know I talked before about Gasly being uh, a very talented driver Ricardo for me is an immensely talented driver but for some reason, McLaren, it just did not work. It didn't work. And I think it's good for both parties that they're going the separate ways because Mc- McLaren lost out arguably on fourth place in the Constructors' Championship this year because of Ricardo. Lando Norris did more than enough to get after them. And obviously, Ricardo, it just wasn't a very happy environment. I actually briefly saw him at the British Grand Prix this year and he didn't look right. He did not look happy. He didn't look confident. And listen to the podcast. I think the, um, the, F- the official F1 podcast not long ago. Listen to that podcast. I found out why, because I think that weekend he was told that he was going to be sacked at the end of the season. So I absolutely understand why he was not his happy honey, ba- honey badger shell. You know, it was, um, it was an absolutely dismal year for him. He deserves an E grade. He's going to be uh, the reserve driver for Red Bull next year. I hope whatever he does, he's just going to be happy and he's going to, and he's going to do well. But you know, I was saying that I, you know, I hope that one day Vettel will come back to Formula One, and I, I don't know if Ricardo's got it in him anymore. I think he's, I think this, these last two years at McLaren, aside from the win last year, they've just absolutely crushed his confidence, and it's sad. It really is, but yeah, he's deservedly. I mean, there were t- honestly there were times at this season when I was saying that he was the worst driver on the grid, and I include Nicholas TV in that, and t- just in terms of poor, pure performance. Um, so yeah, he's deservedly down there on our list, really. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, that that I think that win in Monza last year was a bit of a false dawn for him, almost a bit of a false positive, and it couldn't mask what was really going on. I said at the tail end of last season, the start of the season, hopefully the new regs will give him a chance to sort of like reset and, you know, adapt for the rest of it. But no, um, and, you know, you can say that the McLaren car this year wasn't very good, which it wasn't. His teammate still got a podium, and his teammate was still right up there. And... Yeah, I I think I think um, you know I think McLaren had to cut their losses on him, but yeah, it's a shame because you know because a, a lot of people like him, but you know, he's been in F1 for an awfully long time now, and you know you can't be around forever. Speaking of um, drivers who have overstayed their welcome in F1, Jowards, Lance Stroll got an E. He's just a bit of an idiot, isn't he? You know, he seems a statement. To, yeah, you know we we, uh, we can't swear on here, so. Uh, um, but um, but yeah, you know, he just he just just had some stupid accidents this year, some clumsy collisions, and just it just it, his whole sort of perspective, his whole attitude and, and demeanor um, hasn't done him any favors. Yeah, you, you know, that's before he even gets in the car. Do you think he is fair? Do you think he's generous? Do you think it's harsh? Well, I think probably a bit generous because I think I gave him an F as well this year, and yeah. I mean, you you touched on it straight away about the accidents. Now, at that same point in the season, we were all talking about Pierre Gasly potentially facing a race ban because he's, you know, 10 out of 12 penalty points or whatever the system is. Whereas I thought not straight away after Austin, but after what happened in Sao Paulo in the sprint race with his almost putting his teammate in the wall with the same sort of late move that he made on Alonso. And that ended up in a catastrophic accident on the pit straight, uh, not on the pit straight, on the main straight in, um, in Austin, that that sort of behavior warrants a race ban, you know, like the fact that it's not just once he's done this, it's twice now. What are you doing, mate? Twice in the space, three races. Is he going to learn from it? Who knows? Cause I feel like there's nobody in the team there in that organization that's going to keep him accountable because, of course, your dad's always going to tell you you're doing a good job, son. Keep doing what you're doing, even if it is to the team's detriment. And that's where I think it's really sad from 
the perspective of the brand Aston Martin. It's a prestigious brand. It's well known over the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yet, you know, even though they don't have the best car at the moment, and they, you know, kind of not even in the middle of the midfield, you know, they're on the tail end of it. That their performances are being hampered by stupid mistakes from Stroll. You look at his teammate. Yes, four-time world champion, but he missed two races, then retired in the first race that he was able to partake in this season, still finished miles ahead of him in the championship as well. So this is where with Stroll, when you look at him on paper, yes, there's flashes of brilliance, and he was, what, fifth in Austin in qualifying and was as high as, what, third or fourth at one point early on in the race. But where's the consistency? Where's the improvement year on year? Because believe it or not, Stroll's been in F1 for what five or six seasons now, you know. And yes, we've seen some some results from him. We've seen a podium and a front row and everything. But yeah, exactly. So where's the improvement year on year? You know, if he wasn't, I mean, it's it's a well known fact that if he wasn't associated with the team owner in the way he is he wouldn't be on the grid right now. And that's the injustice of it all. I'd love to see Aston Martin as a team and as a brand succeed one day, but under the current guys that it is, it is, it doesn't seem likely because you're always going to have, you know, Lance in the car and unless he gets his act together and he finds some motivation to actually, you know, feel the, you know, feel the whatever you want to say, joy or, you know, the awe of being on a Formula One grid. You're one of 20 drivers who gets to do this for a living. At least, you know, show like you care sometimes because in interviews and stuff, it's just like, uh, you know, it's whatever. It's whatever. Sounds like a grumpy teenager most of the time. And, you know, for someone who is taking up a seat on the grid, which I'm sure, you know, there's other drivers who would, you know, they wouldn't kill for this seat, you know, not that I condone that sort of thing, but they would, you know, go out of their way to make sure they had a seat on the grid and Stroll is not one of those. So, yeah, what more can you say? It's the same thing every year, basically, and same thing every race weekend, end up having to say something critical about it. Not that it's going to change anything, but, you know, just want to just want to be heard. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it's safe to say that if Strollstad didn't own the team or didn't keep buying new teams, he wouldn't be an F1. And yeah, like you said, Jared, we haven't seen development year on year and he hasn't got better. If anything, he's got worse. And it's a shame because he did show some promise. He's had a pole position. You know, he's had some really good races. He's had some really good starts in the wet. He's a very good wet weather driver. However, he is just inept in so many other areas that unfortunately that doesn't make up for his for his shortcomings but yeah you know there are only so many times you can uh, you, you can you can sort of press on him and last but by no means least is our final canadian driver um it's not been a good item for canada in in, in this season of this podcast phil uh we have nutella man nicholas latifi he got an F. I graded him as a U, which in the UK in the exams means ungradable because I think he was that bad. What I will say just before I give you the floor is just my thoughts on it. I think after Abu Dhabi 2021, um, he received so much hate and he received death threats. I think that just affected him and that's why he went backwards this season. Also, the card did go backwards. However, his teammates still scored points and Sifu was routinely P20 in qualifying. Phil, Latifi, great sell. Yeah, I mean, I thought he was going to come over here and run IndyCar. Uh, maybe there's still a possibility of that. In the end, we knew what he was for his whole entire time in Formula One. George Russell routinely beat him as teammates, and then Albon comes in, one of George's, part of that whole uh, uh best super best friends crew and um misses races with a health scare still beats him uh what is it nick devries gets in the car with one practice at the italian grand prix qualifies well and scores points i mean that right there 
it's not i mean even if you wanted to go and question certain it's when you have a guy who's coming from outside the team has tested or done some sim work literally jumps in the car for one practice gets and gets it into the top 10 and gets the gets points and the jig is up i think he'll have a very successful opportunity in lmp2 for as long as that lasts in uh world endurance championship or some other sports car class i'm sure dale coin would take his money here in the united states to drive the 51 car uh, an indy car but yeah uh, his day is done now in formula one and uh an american comes back onto the grid for the first time in a full-time capacity uh since 2006 so we will see what happens with that with williams hopefully they actually bring a car that is worthwhile uh to the table yeah i think he's i think his days were numbered in f1 and, you know, there were even rumors earlier in the season that he wasn't even going to last uh, last the whole season he was going to be swapped out midway through you know I, you know I, I think i think that was when people started taking notice of nick de Vries. but uh but yeah not not a particularly good season for him but i think it's probably his worst season in f1 though he, he did sneak a point in uh was it? I think it was Japan, and he, and he did put it Q three in um, in Silverstone. So maybe I was a bit harsh with you. Maybe NF was was right. Who knows? He still did a better job than me, regardless. So that is our roundup of all twenty drivers. That is F one Chronicles driver roundup of the twenty twenty two season. An interesting season in many ways. Just before we um just uh, just before we we round up. I just want to ask each each of you individually what you think the best battle was this season, whether it was uh, whether it's a season long thing, an on track battle. What was your sort of like highlights in your sort of like combat of the season? So um George, we'll go to you first. Uh I was afraid you were gonna to come to me first there. Um, <laughs> um I mean the what the one for me personally as a McLaren fan, the highlight for me of the season because we didn't have a championship battle after after the halfway, halfway point, the one for me is the McLaren v Alpine battle. As painful as it was to see my team lose, that was that was the long running battle of the season that I was keeping my eyes on the most. Um, but I want to give a shout out as well to uh, Aston Martin's resurgence in the second half of the season as well. You know, we do uh, we do in- insult them at times on this show, but fair play, they did improve the car a lot over the course of the season. It could be a much better campaign for them. Not least with Fernando Alonso in the and lead driver, uh, lead lead driver seat of that car too next year for them. So that's uh, that's one of my big takeaways from twenty twenty two. Yeah, no, that's a that, that's that's a good po- that's, that's a good point, Baston Masson, Actually, Jared, what what was your sort of like moment or highlight of the season? Um, I look back at the Silverstone Grand Prix, despite you know the first lap incident involving uh, Russell and Joe, and of course the numbskull protesters invading the track as well it it was a race that had everything and it was just it reminds me of you know how disappointing it is that the sport is trying to shift to this formula e mentality of you know wanting to set up races in destination cities i mean that's fe's usp let's just leave that alone Formula One excels at tracks like Silverstone and, you know, with these new regulations and the new cars that can follow each other a lot more closely. I mean, Pirelli brought out the stats and said there was 31% more overtakes this year compared to last. And, you know, Silverstone was just one of those races where you had battles all over the grid. You know, you had at the front, you know, three-way fight potentially for the lead between Red Bull, Ferrari and Mercedes and, you know, the the crowd you could hear through the TV when Hamilton pulled off a double overtake on, on Leclerc and Perez at that point. So that was exciting. And then you go further down the grid, you had all, all the battles going on. So, you know, that was kind of my highlight for me, you know, like George, I'm a McLaren fan. So there wasn't much to shout about this season. So I can't really say much there, but um, you know, when you look at the sport from a neutral's perspective, that's kind of what you want to see. That was the objective with 
the new regulations in 2022. Ultimately, it didn't pan out that way in terms of the championship fight. But, you know, overall, I think, you know, these new cars, what we've seen is an improvement on what we've had in the years gone past. No, ab- ab- absolutely. And, um, and Phil, last but not least, what was your sort of like moment or battle of the season for you? Uh, Jawad took mine. Uh, so I'm going to change it up here. I think the battle that was interesting to me, probably personal bias, was the dynamic between George and Lewis. And that came out, of course, at the Brazilian Grand Prix. You had Lewis course with the mercedes strat having to go and make a comeback and chase his younger hungry teammate and in the end um, like most of the season even though to be fair after the summer break lewis was generally the better driver um george didn't didn't uh uh go and have hesitation you didn't uh get nervous in that moment and he closed the deal and it's something to look at in terms of that balance between teammates in terms of having a team that's working together even in a time when they didn't make it uh they made a really bad car i think that that dynamic we'll see how that builds if they have a better car with the w14 and they're able to run up front uh and be with ferrari and red bull i think that we will see uh, how the dynamic changes between those two guys but all things are good um i personally enjoyed the that that kind of dynamic and interplay uh, which seemed to be a little more energy because george was able to kind of finish the job something that his predecessor wasn't able to do and took you know a bad car and was able to make something out of it Yeah, no, the, the um, yeah, that that sort of Mercedes interesteam battle was was uh, was was pretty good. And for for me, I think I think my favorite battle of the season was um, was Carlos Sainz against Ferrari in both Silverstone and in France when when they took when they told him to to back up to 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 declare, and he told them to stop inventing. And when and when uh, and when um, and also when Sainz was going wheel to wheel with Perez, and they said box now. And it was just like, how dull can you get? Um, but it's Ferrari. They continue to amaze us. And I think next year will hopefully just, hopefully it'll be the gift that keeps on giving. So I just want to, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for, for joining me. So I just want to give, um, give all of you a quick, uh, quick chance to, uh, to give us a plug where you're from. So Jared, tell us a bit more about yourself. Where can we find you? What do you do? Yeah, so um, host of Hit the Apex podcast, which I've just wrapped up another season with the F1 season review just yesterday, and also a um, season review of sorts for the Supercars Championship as well here in Australia. I did last week, I was at the Adelaide 500 a couple of weeks ago. Great, great event. So um, do listen to that so you can hear me talk all about that. And um, yeah, you know, that's that. There's a Twitter account at the Apex Media and some other links to various other things that I'm up to. Lovely stuff. Um, Bill, you're from the Grip Strip podcast. Where can we find you? Uh, basically, you can find the GSP anywhere you get podcasts. Uh, we got a new, we're refreshing things here just before the new year, uh, rebranding a little bit. So uh, check out the new logo on our Twitter page at Grip Strip Pod. Uh, you can see it also on my feed at Philip G. Matthew, my co host is josh huffine it's jp huffine a former guest on the show Uh, so um, we talk about all things motorsports this coming week we're actually gonna uh, go over the formula one season so prior to taking the holiday break we'll go over the 2022 formula one season so if you guys are interested in listening to myself and josh go over it then uh, give us a like listen and subscribe uh, on the GSP and um, a great job as always Tom and great to hang out with you Jawad and George uh, here uh, on uh, Grid Talk always love being on
Thanks, Phil. And George, uh, as mentioned, you are the co-founder of Football Chronicle and you're also obviously a co-host here on Ephraim Chronicle. Where can we find you? Yeah, so I'm a co-founder on uh, Football Chronicle. That's football spot over you, the Spanish way. I think the, I think the double O was already taken by somebody. Uh, if you want, go and check out my opinions on, uh, on football and particularly the World Cup, which has going, been going on, head over to footballchronicle.com. Uh, yeah, I'm obviously I am the, I am the OH. I'm the original host of the Grid Talk podcast. So uh, odds are, especially if you go back in time to 2020 or 2019, I pretty much hosted almost all of them back then. So, but yeah, I've not been on for a very long time. I want to thank everybody in the in you know the F1 uh, Grid Talk team who's who's covered and done an amazing job when I've really not been available for the last few months. Um, I'm not going to say why. It's a it's a private reason for myself, but yeah, and, and also big thanks to all the fans as well, um, who have downloaded this show. I think we've passed 250 shows now, which is just it's just insane. If you'd have told me that when we did our first, I'd be like, no chance, no way we are getting anywhere near that. Um, so it's been fantastic, and obviously, we have to have some very exciting things to improve the overall experience as well. Um, next year as well. So 2023 is gonna be a big year for us here on uh, F1 Grid Talk. Yeah, thanks, buddy. It's uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it it has been a good year for us, and like I said, I'm very very glad to see you back. And it's been very very good to have you back on. So, Grid Talk is available on YouTube, where most of our episodes are recorded live. You can also find us on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, Omni Studio, and Pocket Cast. If you just search for Formula One Grid Talk. We'll find our back catalogue of shows with previews, reactions to qualifying race results and some of our fireside episodes. Please also consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get better mics, lights and recording equipment. You can also get your hands on some official Grid Talk merch at f1chronicle.com forward slash store. Also, please make sure you're subscribed so you're the first to know when each new weekly episode is released. Also, you can press that bell icon so you get a notification every time we go live. We will be back soon with more F1 content during the off-season. But for now, thank you very much for listening and goodbye.